Hello and welcome back to New Scientist TV. This month we attend the debut performance of an unusual band. We also visit a fueling station of the future. But first we look at how dead pigs could help crime scene investigators. Sandrine Kerstamont takes up the gruesome tale. Here in Nottingham, Andy Chick is seeking a resting place for three dead pigs. Before they're left to decay, two of them are injected with different amounts of nicotine. He's hoping to model how a human body would decompose if that person had been a smoker. The actual pigs were injected with a small dose of nicotine into the throat area, roughly where you would expect for the largest concentration of nicotine to be on a smoker. We're hoping that this will give sort of at least a ballpark sort of idea as to what effects it will have in the wild. As a corpse decays, insects feed off of it. Different species are expected at each stage of decomposition. But the presence of nicotine can delay visits from certain insects or even deter them altogether. The point about the nicotine is that it's a common toxin which is obviously present in a lot of people. It is one of the factors which may reduce the rate of decomposition because of course nicotine has insecticidal properties because it's a, it's a plant product which is designed to repel herbivores from eating plants. Two weeks later, the team is already seeing differences. There are more flies around the untreated pig. The flies on the treated ones avoid the areas that contain nicotine. We found that on the high dose pig, the flies were quicker to lay around the genital and anal regions before they'd saturated the head region. The low dose pig had eggs laid on the head, but nowhere else, at a much lower frequency than we noted on the control. A few weeks later, the untreated pig has decomposed the most. Maggots on the two others have accumulated at the ends of their bodies, which are nicotine-free. These differences could affect how the time of death of a smoker is calculated. The objective of this particular piece of research is to find out how important uh, this toxin, um, nicotine, is in relation to changing the rate of decomposition so that um, we can actually go back to the, the forensics um, investigators and say, OK, you need to add X number of hours to your estimate. Next, can you turn an iPad into a musical instrument? Jim Giles reports from California. I'm here at Noisebridge, a hackers collective in San Francisco, to listen to one of the first ever iPad music performances. There are already lots of music apps for the iPhone, but I'm interested to see what use musicians can make of the iPad's bigger screen. The Articulator app has been put together by two local musicians. It allows anyone to create music with gestures and visuals. The two only met a month ago and the app is still in development. So tonight is an experiment of sorts to see how the articulator does in a live setting. The nice thing about like doing sort of a new form of music is you can't screw it up too bad. And I think that's that's really honestly one of the things that like we're interested in an articulator in general is like uh, lowering the bounds for what does it take to make a piece of art on the iPad? What does it take to make a piece of music? Explain to me how the app works. Well, uh, we wanted to go with a very visual and physical metaphor, so the basic, the simplest thing you can do is to draw something. And finger painting is, you know, just really the, the basic action here. So if I, you know, just create this line here, it's just a curve, but it has a contour. It's this sweeping downward arc. And if I play that back, it sounds like a sweeping downward arc. We're kind of tuned from birth for uh, understanding pitch uh, in ways that are beyond just musical. An articulator excels at doing very interesting and dramatic things like this. So you know, draw kind of a sound bloom here, and so you'll see that it looks like it's starting at the same pitch and then it's going to kind of diverge. And so we'll play that. And now you'll hear right here. There's no language in between you and the sound. This is eliminating uh, all the barriers to entry for creating music, for composing and performing music. From Noisebridge in San Francisco, I'm Jim Giles reporting for New Scientist TV. Woo! 
Finally, we check out a project that's paving the way for the next generation of cars. Sean O'Neill takes up the story. This may look like an ordinary fueling station, but it could play a key role in our transport future. Located at Birmingham University in the UK, it pumps out hydrogen instead of petrol. It's one of a ring of stations that has just been installed in the region. This was the uh, first UK fueling station. It's designed to allow people to um, get to develop the vehicles that will use the fueling stations of the future. Hydrogen is a fuel of choice because it doesn't produce carbon emissions. But today it still has a carbon footprint. It tends to be produced from natural gas and petrol fueled vehicles are used to transport it. Primarily the route uh, to produce green hydrogen that is most well known is electrolysis and that way you would use electricity and pass it through either water or brine. Some of the other ways that we're looking at are, are quite innovative and we're looking at changing uh, maybe municipal waste into hydrogen. Cars that use hydrogen efficiently also need to be developed. The ring of fueling stations should help projects like Microcab do just that. It's a campus vehicle, it was designed to do 20 miles an hour, we've got a speed limit of 20 miles an hour on campus. And we demonstrated that it can be twice or three times as efficient as an ordinary engine car. Hydrogen is pumped into the car where it's stored in a cylindrical tank. When a valve is opened, it feeds a fuel cell where the hydrogen reacts with air to generate electricity. The electricity then goes to the electric motor and to the batteries to, to drive the vehicle. And a little bit of water then comes from the bottom uh, as the product uh, coming out of the little pipe. To compete with conventional road vehicles, the battery and fuel cell still need some serious work. They aren't powerful enough and are far too expensive. But improvements have been made to a new fleet of cars. They're expected to hit the road later this year. There will be eight new microcabs delivered and those will be much more powerful. They will go further, they will fit the urban cycle so we can drive in the cities, they'll be road legal. And so a number of improvements, so that will be a great uh, step forward around about September, October this year. That's all for now, but there are lots more videos that you can watch on our website. You can check out some gravity-defying robots, or see how a game of Tetris can be played on a display made entirely of water. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.